It's getting a bit much, wasn't it? Um, just want to say a big welcome to everyone to our follow-up web webinar, um, at Leeds United Promotion Special. We are Premier League, it was never in doubt. Um, my name is Rob Foley, Managing Consultant for Grishan IT, and we have Rob Gelder and Matt Wood from Grishan who will be helping me ask the questions to our expert panel. Um, for those of you that don't know, Grishan are an IT solutions and resource business based in Leeds. Um, we've been running a number of kind of high tech and leadership events this year to help the tech community engaged, especially during lockdown. Um, but we mostly live in Leeds. We're very proud to be in Leeds and we are most of the Leeds fans. Um, so this is just a special treat, basically, for everyone. So today we are joined once again by a uh, Leeds legend, Tony Doriga. Hi, Tony. Thanks a lot. Um, we're also joined by the South American LUFC commentator, Bryn Gola Gola Law. <laughs> Hi, Bryn. <laughs> Buenos dias. <laughs> Um, and Adam's here as well, who wasn't expecting to join us, but, but he's uh, taken time out of his holiday. So I just want to say a massive thank you to Adam for joining us. Um, it's been it's really right. great listening to Adam over the last year on uh, BBC Radio Leeds. It's been really fantastic. So just want to say a big welcome to everyone. Um, thanks for joining us again. I know it's a hot and sunny day, but hopefully we can all go in the beer garden very, very soon. So yeah, we are Premier League, never in doubt. So yeah, can't believe it. So to kick straight off, so we're going to be looking at a couple of topics today and then um, the all important Q&A at the end and um, we can open it up to everybody else. If everybody could just stay on mute but more than welcome to have your video on and um, that would be really appreciated. So first topic is analysis of how Leeds won the championship and achieved promotion to the Premier League. So my first question um, was to Adam, so what has been the difference this year compared to last Adam? Well, is it on the first tactical changes? Is it players' hunger? Is it just experience? What, what do you put it down to? I, I don't see a big difference. Oh, I didn't see a big difference because we knew we knew Plan A is, is the only plan. So for me, the, the difference things stayed the same at the top end. You think you know the, the ratio of, of chances converted was still pretty low, but where they got better, I just felt defensively is that they they became even more parsimonious and restricted the opposition to very very few meaningful shots. And although some games didn't always uh, go to plan in that way, I think it appeared like the percentage of mistakes that led to goals, bar the two Cardiff games probably, was slightly less this year. So I think Leeds I might just have that little bit more of luck. But I think if I was to point to one thing, defensively they were, they were sounder and, and, and that just a little bit more robust than they have been the year before. Game management was better. Do you think that's a Bielsa change though this year, Adam? Do you think he... Was build, building more from the back, or do you just think it's Ben White that came in and uh, just did an absolutely amazing job for us? Look, if, if you're going for one key defensive change, that was it, wasn't it? A lot yeah. of people were upset about Pontus going, but Ben, noticed, the only <laughs> didn't know too much about Ben, to be quite honest. But and I remember the Forest game at home, thinking, "Wow, is he is he going to be able to cope with a real physical sort of battle?" And I think he came through that pretty well that day, and then he went on, obviously. And, by the end of the scene, you could see he could actually cope then. I think Mitrovic smashing him in the face, all that sort of stuff. Never put him out of his stride. I think he's the single big difference to defence, quite clearly. Um, you know, Janssen going was a blow to him. And it wasn't, for me, to be quite honest, I thought he had to go in, in the scheme of things. But Ben White was just phenomenal. I mean, just unbelievable. He's got everything else there. I mean, it reminds me in some ways of, you know, Woodgate at his best and, you know, yeah. maybe Ferdinand. You know, when you look back at the... Sort of great defenders that have been around the club in the past, so I'd put him in that ilk to be quite honest. Why didn't Brighton start with him? I don't, I don't get they must have some incredible central defenders at Brighton <laughs> for him not to come in. It's just, yeah, anyway, yeah. Um, so Rob, I think you've got the next question for Bryn, Thanks. yeah. So, Bryn, this one's for you. So, um, who are the main leaders on and off the pitch post lockdown? Um, what oh, did they, pre, yeah, post post lockdown, what did they do? Um, I know Berardi seems a big, strong character off the pitch. So I mean, yeah, he, he seems to be a very positive leader. What what are your thoughts on that? Well, it, it's a squad that's blessed with a lot of leaders, to be honest with you, and that's probably because they've evolved, they've grown together as a group, which is it's really unusual in modern football to have a group of players that largely stays the same beyond even a single season these days. So the fact that these lads have been together in some instances now for three or four, maybe more years, um, and one or two have been added to the group but the core has kind of stayed the same, I think that's been crucial 
throughout the course of the season because you've got guys like Stuart Dallas, you've got Gaetano Berardi, um, you've got Barry Douglas in there, you've got Luke Ayling in there, you've got Patrick Bamford in there. They all have a voice. But the, the one who stood out for me, I've got to be honest, in many ways was Liam Cooper because I thought he conducted himself as a captain in terms of what the captain's um, role and responsibility is meant to be. I thought he conducted himself brilliantly in that role. Not only did he have a great season as a player, but I think he also contributed a lot. The way he talked, the messages he delivered was very important. But on that basis, I mean, that, and that, I mean, you can't really, I don't think that differed pre or post lockdown, frankly, because I think that was a core element throughout the entire course of the season. And one of the, the key examples for that, uh, of that group's uh, mentality and strength was actually came through what looked like one of the biggest moments of weakness, which was the post-match interview with Luke Ayling after the Nottingham Forest game. And if you're studying in terms of, um, I don't know, the business aspects of all of this, and you talk about things like body language and the way that you communicate, well, Luke Ayling's body language and the way he communicated in that post-match interview that I was doing with him suggested to many people that Leeds race was run, that the, you know, the thing was falling apart at that stage. Uh, and he and I had a, a, quite an emotional chat about this at the, after the end, end of the season when the, you know, the champagne was still fizzing away there. Um, because Luke's stuff, stuff, you see, I can't say it. He suffers with a stutter. And that becomes more pronounced. In fact, it really only becomes pronounced when he does interviews. So each interview for Luke is quite a challenge. And he's aware of it and he knows that other people are aware of it as well. But in that post-match interview in Nottingham Forest, although the way he delivered the message was kind of rang the alarm bells. What he said in the message, if you analysed it, was very good. It was a very simple message because everyone else had caught up, the gap had gone, and he said, it's fine, we start again, it'll be okay. Well, he didn't say it'll be okay. I said to him, how are you going to sort this out? He said, I don't know. But it was that core message that we start again that I thought was key <clears> from that. So all the sort of fears that people had at the back of that end of that interview that all manifest themselves over the next couple of days were also addressed at that point as well. And that became a good management thing because the players were brought together and Marcel Bielsa had recognised their issues. And we'd heard some mutterings about the players were tired and there was a few, you know, there was a bit of talk around the camp, if you like. But he must have seen and, and sensed that as well. He pulled everybody together. And that's when your strong personalities come through. Then you rely on the big guys. Well, Tony will tell you much better than I ever could. But then you'd rely on the, the big voices in the dressing room. And there are plenty of them, quietly confident, but strong characters who'd obviously learned from last season's um, errors and the way this, the season fell away. They'd learned brilliant lessons from that and they applied those lessons this time around. And they kept talking about the fact we know what happened last year. So they didn't shy away from it. They kept using it and using it and using it, but always delivering this strong message. And they just powered through it in the end. It was very impressive, actually. As it was really good to see a group of players like that come through a challenge and there were one or two challenges along the way but not only come through it but come through it ultimately with flying colours you know the way they blew away the two teams in those last two games kind of tells you all you need to know about that group I would suggest Thanks Brendan that's great M Matt Woods Yeah so Tony I was absolutely baffled to see the uh, championship team of the year um, when it only had Luke Hayden I believe at right back there's been a lot of standout performers this year um, you know, I know voting for the uh, player of the season was extremely difficult because of the performances of so many players. Who do you think were the standout performers for you this year? Uh, I think you're right. I think it's very difficult to pick out uh, a particular player. And I think you could have picked out one of five or six uh, quite comfortably, and I would have agreed with you. Uh, in that group, I would certainly put Ben White, Calvin Phillips, um, Stuart Dallas, Luke Ayling, Pablo Hernandez. Now, that's the five. I feel like I've left out Click, Harrison, Bamford. It, it, it goes on and on. But I, I certainly think uh, those players in particular um, were fantastic. Obviously, the Coops uh, as well, just leading them all together. Um, Dallas, I, I think for me, he filled so many holes and so many gaps when I think we could have had a problem just the, the way Bielsa um, managed to fit him into certain positions. And he you know, got on with the job and did fantastic. At times when Luke Ayling was missing, when he played right back, right midfield, he was just incredible. Then he goes to midfield, does a job. He goes to left back and does an amazing job. So uh, we had so many standout performances. But what I really liked, I think, as well, was was Pablo. 
towards the end of the season because uh, Brent's right. When, when things are tough, the, the, the more inexperienced players of the group you know, will look to those older players uh, that have been there and, and done it. And last season, I thought Pablo uh, didn't have the greatest of last six or seven games. And, and that period when you know, we were struggling, I remember going, was it Brentford, I think, we, we lost at home, then we did it at Wigan as well. You know, players were in tears and what have you, and, and you're waiting for someone to, to get hold of it and drag us across that line. This year, he dragged us across that line. My God, he was magnificent. And they found a way of using him, utilizing him in the best way. So many games in a short period of time. We put him on for 45 minutes when we've already, you know, ran them ragged for 45. Physically, it's demanding. Any sort of space we get in that second half, which we do, Pablo goes and exploits it. And he exploited it, you know, fantastically well. And, and of course, that Swansea game away where somehow, I don't know how he found space between legs, keeper, mm. post inches, millimetres, and uh, he stuck it away. Only he could have done that. So I'm delighted for him. But those big moments, uh, I think you do remember the previous season, what happened. And uh, that's where I think a lot of the players stepped up. Not just one or two. I thought a lot of them were. Uh, and Brin's right. Suddenly, you look at the last couple of games, the way we, we spanked the teams. You know, it wasn't even close. You know, Stoke just wanted to retreat you know, and go backwards. Just We're going to batter them. We batted them five anyway, you know. It was just, uh, yeah, brilliant to see. We'll get onto the Barnsley game. That just done my head in that game. But, <laughs> however, it didn't matter. We won by 10 points. And it just shows, I think, that the, uh, the, the ability of uh, our team, You're not one outstanding performer, there was lots of them. Yeah, no, I completely agree. I think it was a fantastic team performance this year. I agree, Pablo was absolutely standout performer for me at the end of the season. Um, some of the passes he was playing, the goals that he contributed, absolutely fantastic. So it's great to see that he obviously got the, the Play of the Year award for, for this season. Uh, so thank you for that, Tony. Rob, over to you. Yeah, um, Adam, this one's for you. Um, when, it was, when we knew we were going to win, I think what, I, what struck me was the coaching staff were at Four Parch at half past 10 at night, it seems, still working. And obviously we all know about Bielsa as a leader. However, have we as fans overlooked the work ethic and influence of the backroom staff, and in particular, the coaching staff? I just wonder if you give some insight into that, because I've never really spoken about. Well, when you go to Thor Parch, and the only times we're there really is to do a press conference with, or it was prior to COVID, obviously. Yeah. The one thing that struck me, when you walk out, and you, you sort of come out of the, the room, turn left. There's two coaches sat on the right-hand side. One is uh, Alessandro, the goalkeeper, one of the goalkeeping coaches, who's new this year. He's been around a bit, not to count Norwich, Stoke, what have you. Another one next to him. Then turn left, there's three other coaches busily working away on, on laptops. So then Matt Grice, the team manager, you see he's in a little office too. So he put a constantly on it. You, there's at no point you sense that there's an idleness or anybody swinging the ledge, you know what I mean? So... Mm. So, yeah, and then, then you hear Bielsa, obviously, credit his backroom staff constantly, doesn't he? I mean, he doesn't want to take any of the plaudits himself. But then, obviously, you do hear stuff, you know, on the sly, what have you, and they are words, like dogs. They really are. They, they are words, <laughs> really intensive. And I think the best example, and I think Huddersfield have made a great signing in that, is Carlos Coburn. He was there prior to Bielsa, and it was made quite clear to Massa that he was going to be part of the package when he came. And... Um, he managed to somehow take a 23 side that had, like the, well, it's like the League of Nations, wasn't it? The amount of players being thrown at him. Being accused, really, of, of, or the club being accused of not having enough homegrown talent. That The only word you heard was Spanish around the place. He took all that. Players that were coming in and leaving more or less straight away and going to, you know, other sort of satellite clubs, uh, as were. And somehow turned that into a winning machine. And at the same time, was on the shoulder of Barcelona Bielsa. 24-7, if you like, in the dugout when it came to the first team matches. I think he's the clearest example of the work ethic that's in place and what you need to do, what you need to sacrifice if you're going to reach the top of anything. These guys have raised, well, Marcelo has raised the bar and they followed. And I think Carlos, not being an immediate disciple of his, is probably the best example of someone that's bought into it and gone the whole way and now has been rewarded with a first team position himself at another club. So, the work ethic is huge. It's and you you feel it everywhere. I've been at the club, been around the club a long time, and you can tell when things are slack. You can, and uh, it is. It, it's and they deserve huge credit. They really do. So he, he's not saying it glibly when he gives them praise. He really does mean it, and they they, they earn their call. They're scared of him, 
but yeah, it works. <laughs> I'm a bit scared of eyeballs. <laughs> <Actually, laughs> I've just got a little, sto a little story about that as well. When uh, uh, pre-season, I went to um, uh, Australia with the team, which was fantastic. And we just played, I think, Manchester United in Perth. And uh, then we flew to Sydney. And by the time we got to the hotel and you know, everyone checked in their rooms and what have you, it was about 11 o'clock, 11, about half 11. As, as I got there, uh, his team were there around their laptops you know, and trying to get some food, but talking with their laptops, you know, writing down the way it was like, it's half 11. So then I order some food, so I'm eating away. Those just disappeared. They disappeared. I thought, right, they've all gone to bed at last. I sat there, had a one or two drinks with some, uh, some of the uh, exec team that followed the team around. As I go back to my room, I look over to my right and I see in a conference room, those same four guys are now in this conference room with big TVs. Marcelo's in there. He's got his food in there. It's not now half 12. They're still working away at their laptops pre-season after just traveling from Perth for God knows how many hours. It was just incredible. Um, I obviously left them to it. I went to bed, <laughs> uh, but they cracked on. <laughs> Brilliant. Thanks for that, Tony. Uh, Rob, I think, well, I think you've got a similar question for Bryn. Yeah, well, well, the next question was about Carlos, to be fair, and I think you, you've covered some of the, um, the influence that he's had this season. Um, I suppose he's moving on now, isn't he? So do you think he'll be missed next season, Bryn? Um, well, it, it remains... I, I'll be honest, I don't think he will, because I think they'll find somebody to fill the gap there. Like Adam said, he was there before, so he wasn't part of the original kind of travelling Bielsa team because that's how it works with Marcelo Bielsa. Basically, his guys travel around with him. Um, so he, he tends to work with the same people or want to work with the same people. But I think they'll find either he'll recruit, he'll you promote from within, if you like, or I think he'll, he'll, he'll have been around enough to know somebody else who can come in and do something similar there. So I think, I, I don't, I, I think it'll be, you know, there are lots of football coaches out there. Now, they don't all work in the same way and all have the same mentality. You might say in some instances, don't all have the same work ethic, but there are lots of coaches out there. So I think they'll, I'm, I'm pretty sure they'll find somebody in that in that position. I mean, the big challenge currently, frankly, isn't whether they cover for what's called run or not. The big challenge currently is to make sure they've got Marcelo Bielsa for their next season. Yeah. You know, and the rest will the rest will kind of follow on from that. So that's job one, basically. You know, they've got the floodlights to do at the stadium and they've got to build media rooms in the tunnel and they've got an awful lot of work to do on the infrastructure of the stadium, which isn't going to be ready in time for the start of the season. So you'll see that kind of developing as the weeks and months go by. So there's all that stuff to do to prepare. But I think everybody knows the number one priority role is make sure that guy, for the first time, as far as I'm aware, ever stays on at a club for the third season he's never done it before yeah we don't want to be having th that conversation do we will be also be missed because uh, well, we no that's it you know that's, that. that's, that's it that's the that's so that's the that's the that's the biggest job I mean all the signs are good you know I've seen him sitting in Costa in Weatherby wearing his Adidas gear now not the Kappa stuff so he's he's obviously he's progressing <laughs> ah. mentally he's changed his training kit so that's a that's a that's a good sign he's not in the past he's in the future uh, he's in the here and now on that basis and obviously conversations are already taking place about in terms of recruitment and they, that work will have started before the season had ended for absolutely certain so the fact he's he's being seen around and about I mean he, he, he's got no choice has he? I think he's got a queue of people outside his front door in Weatherby at the moment basically wanting pictures and stuff and I saw a picture of him with a little baby the other day that someone was almost presenting it. It was like sort of touched by the hand of God type thing so you've, <laughs> you've got all this going on that people the people you know, the, the, the outpouring of love and adoration for this guy is just incredible and understandable. Um, and you've got to hope that he's had adoration elsewhere. I mean, he was at Newell's Old Boys, his club in his city, Rosario. He took them to the title and then he, then he left. You know, it was one of those where you think, how did that happen? But so there is kind of precedent. You wouldn't, you would not say currently absolutely 100% certain that he's definitely, definitely, definitely going to be in place at the start of next season, if only because he has a habit previously of going suddenly and without any real warning. When he feels the situation isn't quite what he needs it to be, perhaps. At Lazio, he lasted days, was it, at Lazio, when he decided the situation wasn't good and he, and he went. 
So uh, he went quickly at Lille as well. So I think I think that's it. Just get that one priority job done, and then everything else kind of follows on from that. And um, Rob, right, thanks for that, Bryn. Um, Tony, I've got a question for you, and it, we need to talk a little bit about Barnsley. <laughs> so, obviously, as a player for Leeds United, how influential is it, Ellen Road crowd, positive or negative? Do you think playing in front of an empty stadium with Barnsley um, meant, meaning that we would have maybe have lost it with 35,000 fans being very anxious? Um, I, I kind of feel as though we would have done. Um, what, what do you think on that one, Tony? Um, I think the, the Barnsley performance, you say, would we have lost it or not? I think we mentally lost it anyway. That second half was the, the strangest uh, performance I've ever seen. I think for me personally, uh, playing in front of a crowd at Ellen Road is always a huge positive. You know, absolutely. Yeah. It does give you a little bit of uh, added pressure. But I think uh, if you're the right type of player for Leeds, then you, you thrive off that pressure and you use that positively. Um, absolutely. And even if there's only a few people in the ground, uh, I struggle. I'd rather have 100,000 hating me but playing in that atmosphere. For me, that's, that's fantastic. So I think it's more difficult, absolutely, at Ellen Road without the crowd. I think it's uh, something that players obviously don't expect. But for an away team coming to Ellen Road, they must think this is Christmas. You know, no one's having a go at them. <laughs> you know, it's, it's quiet. It's, I love the pitch surface. It's, it's wonderful. And this lot here leads. We'd love to do them over. You know, it's one of the, the biggest team in the championship. Let's go there and have some fun. Uh, and because there's no real pressure on them. So... I can see for our lads at Ellen Road, it, it being quite difficult. Uh, that Barnsley game was just, I kept looking at Bryn during the commentary and I, we kept just shaking our head. We didn't know what to say. It was just crazy. And Barnsley were fantastic. And I, I explained that as if, remember the FA Cup game we played against Arsenal? You watch that first 45 minutes. I think if you swap the Arsenal shirts to the Leeds players and vice versa, it wouldn't have been out of place because we played fantastic, just like a Premier League side. Barnsley played like us, swapped the shirts. They were magnificent. We were the guys at the bottom of the table and it was, it was amazing to watch. I think I also kept watching on to see the confusion at the back and how we were changing systems uh, you know, every five minutes or so and even players within those systems to different sides of the pitch. Uh, if you think as well that Charlton are bottom of the table. We are top of the table. In the second half, we're making substitutions to try and stop what they're doing. I mean, it's just an incredible situation because I've never come across that before. Talking to the players, they understand that when there is a, a tactical change by the opposition, they do change their positions and they play a different way. So they're having to, to learn, become educated on lots of different systems and automatically do it when they're playing. But this is a team at the bottom and we're at the top and we're at home. It just none of it made any sense to me at all. In my head, it's right. We're going to batter you lot. We're at the top. We're going to play it our way and you're not going to be good enough. Simple as that. But no, no, that's not the way we do it. And all of a sudden, it kind of came unstuck in that second half. And uh, people say to me, you know, do you feel sorry for Barnsley? And everyone's going, no, nah, I'm not sorry for them. I feel sorry for them. They were fantastic and they got absolutely nothing. However, we managed to to get the three points somehow. And to me, I look back at all the previous performances we've had in the season. You know when we take 20 attempts at goal to finally get one? You know what? That's a bit of retribution for us because we really, I think, should have been out of sight in this league. We finished 10 points clear. I do think properly. Honestly, it should have been more. You know, we were good enough to do that if we could only take an average amount of our chances per game. But that Barnsley game, I think it might have come back to us and. Uh, and gave us a bit of luck there. But uh, yeah, I think that the no crowd, back to your question, the no crowd definitely for me helps the away side. And can I just add on that one when Tony said that we were um, that we were looking at each other all the way through this process, this lockdown process in particular, Tony DiRigo is the man, the calm headed professional with the insight into the game who is telling me, come on, Brian, of course they're gonna get promoted. Where's <laughs> you've come on, you've been you've been overly pessimistic here. I knew there was a problem when I looked to my right-hand side on the gantry and Dorigo is sitting there watching the game pretty much like this. And I thought, oh, no, this, this is clearly... Because Mr. Mr. Optimistic, Mr. It's not going to be a problem, 
is now head in hands can barely watch the game here in the second half. So uh, it was it was <laughs> there was a salutary lesson for us all there maybe. And and on the same by the same token, Jermaine Beckford had said before the Luton game when we were chatting just be, right before the start of the commentary he said, "Don't worry, bro. This will be plain sailing." That's the phrase he used. <laughs> <laughs> plain sailing, right? So if you wonder occasionally why I have bouts of pessimism, I hear a phrase like that, an alarm bell, the karma bells start ringing in my head when I hear a plain sailing. And then you go, it wasn't plain sailing, was it? I think we were doing all this before the last one about promotion. It was anything but plain sailing. So why did you say that? But that's me, because I'm the kind of um, the enthusiastic amateur and know more than that. But uh, yeah, <laughs> Derigo De lost it in the second half at Barnsley. It's <laughs> cold. I think we all did. I that wasn't one. the only one. Exactly. Oh, that's exactly. Exactly. I wasn't the only one. We all did, didn't we? We all yeah. did. Yeah, never felt so deflated after a victory. Yeah, because it was like also there's that sense of is that it? Is that how they're going to win it? They're going to hand it's going to be somebody else will do the job for them over the weekend after that horrible performance. I mean, it was the worst we've seen under Bielsa by far. And do you know what? Barnsley did that at Oakwell. You know, they were unlucky at Oakwell. They created a lot of chances at their place too. So, yeah, but whether a crowd would have made a difference, there, they couldn't score. You know, so I don't think you know thirty eight thousand they would have helped them. They could just couldn't score. Um, but I don't know. It was it was awful. I just felt everybody felt really. I don't know. You felt, I felt really really flat afterwards. Like like a lot of good work had been undone, and they won the game. It's mad. It's mad. Isn't it? <laughs> it was interesting in that game as well, though. When you talk about changes in in uh, approach from the season previously, to me, when he brought um, Strauch on in that game, that was a a, a decision made based on prag a pragmatic approach to what needed to be done at that stage. So a central defensive, strong physically defensive uh, midfielder was chucked on in there. And at that point you thought, well, I think they they're probably, you know, at worst they're, they're happy with what they've got. And there was quite a long time before the end when he came on Strauch. But it was, he'd done it previously, as Tony had talked about, when he put Strauch on against Cardiff in, in what turned into be a three-all draw. But he put him on at a really difficult time in that game and it didn't work. He made the error, they ended up getting equalising goal. But there's some more lessons learned. That's a young player who's learned a lesson, a harsh lesson from, say, the Cardiff game and then gets chucked into another really pressurised situation, even more pressurised situation against Barnsley. But now he does his job and Leeds see the game out. And what I've seen of Leeds this season, the big difference maybe I noticed was that they were always going hell for leather for the next goal last season. And I think it was a little bit more, I could be wrong, but I think it was a little bit more about the, listen, OK, we don't have to go too wild still here. We can see the game out now from this position. Lots of 1-0 wins along the way kind of thing. So um, maybe that, you use the phrase, Adam, game management. I know it often gets chucked around in football, mm -hmm. but maybe maybe that there's another element there of lessons learned in terms of how much do we have to keep going for this or how much have we already got? Because Leeds could score goals against teams without doing that anyway because they break so quickly from deep positions. So you don't have to throw loads of players forward. You, know, you can do it kind of naturally in the way you're playing anyway. Brilliant. Matt, are you going to um, go to the next section? Thanks for that. Yeah, so on to the second topic. So we're, we're going to talk about Bielsa's management style again. Um, and we want to talk about technology's impact on, on the team's success, really. Um, I know we've talked a lot around Bielsa's strict re re regime and the, the players need to follow under Bielsa. Obviously, what they did during lockdown. Um, I've seen them all on Instagram, on Twitter, all on holiday, holiday together, drinking my way. The party continued, but are they under a strict regime right now? And, and how, how is, when they are under a, a strict regime, how is that? How do you track it and how is it managed? Are, are they on the scales every day? Uh, sorry, Adam, back to you. That one for me, is it? Yeah, yeah. No. Um, <laughs> I've acted on the scales every day at the moment. They've been on the last since, um, <laughs> since that Friday night, haven't they? So, but in. So generally, right now, um, I would very much not think that they're in, involved in any sort of uh, uh, regime. But I think they're due back around about the tenth, aren't they, or thirteenth, maybe, uh, into training. So the thing is, for them, they know that they've got a brutal, you know, period ahead of them coming into the Premier League. So that they're, they're not going to, yeah, they'll go a bit mad, but they know they're going to have to get in shape pretty quick. Um, from what I understand of the, of the regime, it is, it is severe. I mean, you know, the fat roll tests every day. Uh, and during lockdown as well, I don't think there was any let-up whatsoever. And, the, and 
every player that we spoke to said that the, the medical team headed up by Rob Price, uh, you know, gave them plans, everything was checked, all the, they had to hit the weights, had to hit the running and what have you. And it was like severely regimented, I think. So I always felt confident when they came back after, for the restart, that Leeds would be in a much better position than most other clubs. Um, didn't look that way at Cardiff, but that was down to two mistakes, nothing to do with fitness, it was just a bit of rustiness and what have you. So I think everything was, was really well trapped and has continued to be. You wouldn't expect to be any other way, would you, um, with Bielsa? And, you know, I was hearing things like um, from one of the staff there, they said at one point um, towards the back end of the season, all the guys broke their records for 2K running. I think it was incredible, the, and, uh, which is incredible, isn't it? And the Derby County game, as we've, as we've learned since, something from Calvin Phillips, the information that's been tracked, they ran further than they had done at any point during the season, which is, again, incredible, isn't it? So everything is highly monitored. Um, he's pretty brutal, as I understand it, as Bielsa. If you're not meeting the standards, then, then there's, there's just no way for you. You know, there's, you don't even get a look in. And I think certainly, with, with to an extent, with John Kevin Augustin, that has been, been the situation. So, yeah, highly monitored. Um, I think Rob Price is somebody who appears to be right in the sort of vanguard of the latest sort of developments as well. So, yeah, um, if they're not being tested right now, it won't be long before they are. But uh, from what I can see, they're having a great time, aren't they, in Ibiza? They really yeah. are, yeah. I'm yeah. jealous of Ali Oski on the back at the minute. Um, <laughs> it's all like just, having a great time. I bet he's got a weird like, playlist, Ali Oski. <laughs> <laughs> Acedonian hits. Uh, just on that <laughs> point about the, about the testing and stuff, yes, they're getting weighed every day. And there's a big deal. It's a big deal. It's, there's a lot of there's serious pressure on that weighing process because if mm -hmm. you're over, you're out. And this, there was examples of this last season. Calvin Phillips got dropped on the basis of the fact that he came in over one day. He didn't play that weekend, much to everybody's surprise. So the players are fully aware of the severity of the potential punishment if you don't come in on, you know, on, on weight, basically. So that is a massive pressure. You know, people talk about eating disorders and stuff that footballers, that professional footballers are prone to these days. There's a huge pressure on the lads mm. on that basis. And we've had another conversation with a member of the staff through the course of the season who's describing how when the players feel hungry which is quite often young guys doing a lot of running around every day. When the players feel hungry, particularly in the evening, staff will get calls to say, I feel really hungry. What can I eat? Because oh. they feel the need to take guidance <laughs> to make sure that what it is that they take on board isn't going to put them over that following day. So they will, they will, this call could come late at night and what can I eat? And, um, you know, they make their decisions on the basis of what is best for them in terms of their position in the squad. So there's a lot of testing. There's a lot of testing. There's a lot of pressure on them on a day-to-day -day basis. And I think that's one of the great achievements is that he's managed to keep these players on that course when they could have had excuses along the way. And those conversations around that Nottingham Forest defeat were about the fact that players were miserable and tired. But he's managed to galvanise them even from that point on to even higher uh, heights that they that they achieved after they only lost one game after Nottingham Forest away, so there was something in the message that works. When you say to a lot of pro footballers, Tony will tell you far better in a moment than me. I would imagine that he will, you know, if you're saying to footballers day in day out, you can't do this, you can't do this, you can't do this. They've got to be able to see the reason why you can't do this. So they've got to buy into it basically. So these lads clearly saw the benefit, and felt the benefit. And the benefit was running all over Derby in, the, in that final game, running mm. further than it run all season. That's their challenge. Is that right, Tony? Yeah, no, you're actually right. Uh, I think that, you know, that, that message has got to be um, taken on board and, and the reasons they're doing it uh, believed it you know, by the whole squad. Just uh, I'll give you one, one quick instance of a story from my Chelsea days where it didn't work so well. And this is what happens when it goes wrong. Uh, good old Mr. Ken Bates, who uh, I got on great with him. God, what a lovely chap he was. Anyway, good old Ken Bates um, decided that for Chelsea's away games, when we got uh, booked into a hotel and we stayed overnight for the, the following day's game, uh, that our drinks would be restricted at dinner time to one pound's worth. That was it. We could have one pound's worth each. For a drink, and we thought it was a joke to start with, obviously. They go, no, no, seriously, you can only have one drink, one drink, and that's it. So when you've got 
that going on, you're getting told by the top a message. And we, as lads, as a team, we didn't buy into that at all. So we then ordered Pinot Noir, Montrachet, Chablis, Sancerre, and we got absolutely pissed as a fart, put the bill onto the club. We went out next day and won the game, but that's not what you want. Beatty was a, was a nightmare for mucking things up kind of all the time because we didn't buy into it. We were always at, at loggerheads, and eventually we would win five, six games in a row, and we would lose six, seven, eight games in a row. It was an absolute disaster. So the buy-in, I think, of the players is hugely important. But when, it's, when you're sacrificing a lot, and these lads, you know, I talked to them, they've had to sacrifice a lot. You'll happily sacrifice it for getting results. You have to achieve what you're setting out to do. And that's exactly what the team have done. So you will keep buying into it. I'm not being funny. We all want to be successful. We all want to have that reflection of, of champions and success. And if that train is going that way, you want to jump on it and you do anything you can to stay on it. I think that's what's, what's happened with these players. Thanks, Tony. Um, so I think the, the Cardiff game, first first game back after after lockdown, uh, was a massive anticlimax. Um, Bryn, what? How did Bielsa react to that, and what what was his message to the players? Uh, well, I don't know specifically because I've still. I think the last time we spoke, I might have mentioned that I've still never spoken to Marcelo Bielsa. Uh, I saw him in Weatherby once outside of Costa, and that's that. That's me. That's as. I saw him come into the East Stand the other day. We were quite close then, within about 15 feet of each other. But I haven't spoken to him, never, ever spoken to him. So um, uh, my involvement in terms of what he does day to day is, is, is fairly sort of vague on that basis. But I know that the, the, the message throughout the lockdown period, he was delivering little homilies. I, think, I find this very interesting. If you get the chance, I think it's still on the uh, League United website. If you can listen to the um, full match coverage of the that we did, the LUTV full match coverage that we did of the Derby County game, because the game wasn't kind of the be-all and the end-all. And we had Adam Forshaw. I had Adam Forshaw to my right and I had Steve Hodge to my left. So two really good good talkers. And Steve Hodge and Adam Forshaw took up most of the game actually chatting about the way that Leeds work. And I found it absolutely fascinating to sit between them and hear this dialogue because the questions that Steve was asking, he's been a coach as well as being obviously been a, a top, top, top footballer so he was asking questions on the basis of real interest in how they work with Marcelo Bielsa and Adam Forshaw was very very forthcoming in terms of describing how they work with Marcelo Bielsa and there are little speeches and he does um, he, he does work with them in Spanish uh, for predominantly but it will be translated because he feels more comfortable being able to deliver the message he needs to deliver in his in his native tongue um, but it, they all, they've told us this year how, how, and I found this quite a strange concept, but how rousing some of the speeches are that, 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 he, that he comes up with and how they can kind of build to a crescendo, which to me seems really difficult to do in a second language when stuff's being translated. But maybe it's just in some instances, just the vibe they get off him while he's doing this stuff. But he does have these little, um, I mean, he's come across to some degree until the last few weeks maybe as being a, you know, not, almost aloof, almost uh, certainly apart from the players. You know, there's been talk that he's he had no relationship with his players, and we'd heard stories from his his previous times in management of of sometimes how he finds it hard to actually um, register a relationship with players because he's all hundred percent focused only on football and things like family life and stuff are not such a consideration for him. But you've seen in the last few weeks a different side to him, but we've heard stories as well. And Forshaw talked about the way that he has that human instinct, that human approach to stuff. And he can deliver that traditional, more traditional kind of um, rousing message, if you like. So, and, and how he does, I mean, people have said when he was hugging Calvin Phillips, when you saw the footage of them celebrating in the East End on the Friday night, it, uh, it suddenly looked to me like a, a father hugging a son or even a grandfather mm -hmm. maybe hugging a son and Pat Bamford used the phrase didn't he about his, you know, everyone at the moment he's everyone's favourite granddad sort of thing um, it, it, it's that it, it, there seems to be that paternal aspect to it and that, that bodes well for hopefully him staying around as well because he'd like to take these guys you know, onto another stage of that, of that journey that they've all been on together so the way he deals with them, the way he dealt with them through lockdown wouldn't be dissimilar to the way he dealt with them through the rest of the season, I don't think. But um, I, the other slight suspicion I have, and it's only a suspicion, I don't have any evidence to back this up, is that maybe the touch has got a little lighter this year, that the, maybe mm -hmm. there has been a little bit more recognition 
of the need for a bit of give and take in terms of the way that he that he, he uh, han handles them and carries them through this process. I've just got a sense of that, no more of a sense of that. And um, because the players only speak respectfully of him, I mean, more than respectfully, they're, they're gushing in the terms of the way they speak about him. Adam, Adam's probably as well placed to, to talk about that as I would be. I agree with you, but I think there has been uh, definitely a, a little more, yeah, a slight softening. And I think maybe it's become by his own, through his own admission that he's felt that as the sort of leader of the pack, he's had to devolve a bit more of the power this year. I mean, look, ultimately he always says it's, it's me that carries the can, but he did actually admit earlier on this year or this season that he's given, he stood back that little bit and not been quite as hands-on, I think was the expression that, that he used. And if that's what's worked, then I think it has manifested itself in the way that, that Bryn's mentioned there. And maybe, maybe his coaches have managed to sort of, not saying work a few shortcuts, but managed to sort of deflect the blast of what is, you know, a real, I don't know, it's a real furnace of an atmosphere, isn't it? And up there, you know, they're, they're always training in the red zone. Everybody's working really hard. Mate, I do just get that feeling that, that yeah, it's just been, not easier, that's not the right, right term, but just... Not even more relaxed, you know, because the focus has been there. In fact, in many ways, they've been even more focused by getting it over the line. But certainly, the atmosphere seems a little bit. Different. There hasn't been the tense moment, as many tense moments as there were last year. I would say. I know the Spygate brought one on, on its own, but this year, in the main, Marcelo appears to have been that little bit calmer. I mean, still is e equally obsessed, but not, <laughs> not as. No, it was, um, he was prone to the odd sort of bit of an outburst here. And then he had one go, I think, this year where he felt people were taking Mickey out in general. And I think sometimes when he gets to that stage, things can seem much larger than what they really are. But in, in general, there's definitely been a feel of it being just a little bit more, yeah, a bit more easy, like a little bit distance maybe between him and, um, and, his, and his approach, I would say. Maybe he sat up in the office a little bit more and looked down on the pitch as well than being stood there in the middle of murder ball all the time. I don't know. But um, I think Bryn's right in this assessment there that there's definitely been a, 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 something that you've sensed that, that has changed this season. Whatever it is, it's worked. Do you think that's because uh, the players know the score a bit more after last season? And you mentioned around, there's quite a few strong leadership characters in there that will be able to kind of bring, bring the other guys through. And it's, I suppose, a little bit more known now. I think definitely, and I know Marcelo said that too, the guys know what to expect. So he, I think he's trusted them a little bit more. Maybe that's the word, there's that bit more trust. That's a good word. And Tony, Tony, you'll know with the group dynamic, if you've got a group of strong individuals who know their jobs by now, and everybody knows they know their jobs, can you not just leave it in a, in a strong team or a strong group like that? Can The group can almost self-manage, can't it, Tony? Yeah, you're absolutely right. Um... I think when you've got uh, such strong characters, when you understand completely your roles and responsibilities within that structure, uh, you really help anyone that comes in from outside that's new uh, to, to get, uh, I suppose, hitting the ground running quickly. At the same time, if there's a problem, normally it's, it's the group, the lads that sort it out uh, before it gets too much of a problem and gets to the manager. You know, we'll sort it out either on or off the training ground, but it, it'll get done because, yeah, there's such a strength in those numbers. And I think as well, the second season round, I think none of it has been a surprise. You're just adding to the, the understanding and education you've had from the previous season. I mean, only because it's so different, the structure and the way he plays and how he wants um, to perform, the, the you know, fitness levels, the, the ability for a, a centre-half like Liam Cooper, who, let's be honest, probably couldn't pass water. But we didn't know he couldn't pass water because he wasn't allowed to suddenly ping these balls out 60, 70 yards. And now he can because he's been given the confidence. He's been saying, yeah, no, that's what you have to do. And Coops is now pinging on thinking, where's that come from? But it takes a little while to build these things up. And yet another year under your belt of that, you just get, you will improve. Okay, might be improved just percentage points, but that's all we needed. And that's exactly what's happened. Brilliant. Um, I've got a tech question. I think I asked this last time. I'm going to ask it to Tony again. Um, but Tony, can you talk us through technology, um, how it's had an impact on the team's success? Um, what is used? How is it used? What are the benefits? Um, what tech do the coaches use to monitor, improve performance? How prevalent is sports science? And do the players actually care? 
when it comes to technology, or is it just with footballers? Am I going to play football? <laughs> Uh, essentially, if you look if you look back through the the ages, the, the the decades of playing, when we first started, you know, tech, there, there wasn't a, a lot of tech around. Let's be honest. Um, as it progressed, then the tech started coming into the game, but it's very much using it to its best of ability was the problem. You know, so just to say someone ran further than someone else doesn't give you the picture at all. You know, it's a it's a very uh, ambiguous picture that it gives. So now that learning has certainly come on leaps and bounds. Um, the players with tech, they're probably not like it because now there's no hiding place. There's, there's no hiding place, you know, whatsoever. You know, whether it is your, your sprints per game, whether it's your you know, percentage that you, you run, whether it's your distance between the centre half and the full backs, you know, all these areas can get monitored uh, left side, upside down. Um, yeah, I'm not sure they, they would appreciate it, but it's just the way that it's gone. So you're just looking for you know, every little bit extra. Uh, I think now there's lots of new tech as well kind of coming in. And I think. Uh, Fitness-wise, uh, obviously your diet is a, is a gigantic thing, and, and that's you know, very important. But also now, rather than having you know, your, your blood lactate test at a hospital with a doctor or something, you can wear you know certain patches that this now comes in, uh, downloads to an app, so you can you can really finite uh, to you as an individual rather than a, a blanket uh, approach. And I think that's that's the big difference. Whereas before you play, you know, everyone it all fits every single player, doesn't it? But now, no, no. Everything is really streamlined to exactly what that particular player uh, needs. But uh, yeah, they're, they're always wearing their, you know, their, their vests, which will, will uh, clearly uh, record everything. And there is absolutely no hiding place. And uh, you know, me on the other side of things, on a, on a, a commentary side, you know, VAR is doing my bloody head in. I've got to say, it's just it's very frustrating. <laughs> in the, even with a piece of tech, you're thinking, hey, I'm positive about this it's going to get the right decision more often than not. They still get it wrong, for goodness sake. And I do City Art commentaries. My God, I probably half the, half the decisions that the VAR guy has done has decided, I would disagree with. It's because it's the interpretation of the law itself. So it's not the, uh, you know, the golden arrow that fixes the whole lot. So, uh, but to be fair, it gives me another four or five minutes to talk about something else. So, hey, I'm all willing to talk about it. Oh, that's brilliant. Thanks, Tony. Right, we're going to go into um, Q&A and kind of stories from the season, kind of the, the fun part. Um, if any of the attendees want to start putting some questions into the group chat, we, we've got a few that we're, we're going to get through. Um, but if people want to start putting some uh, messages in there. Um, so, Rob, I think you've got the first one for, for Bryn. Yeah. Um, Bryn, did you get your car fixed? <laughs> <laughs> Do you know what? I've got an accident... As coincidence would have it, I've actually taken it to a body shop this morning to get the first <laughs> quote. Uh, the, the quote, by the way, if you're feeling charitable, the quote is 360 quid, which is fairly, re fairly reasonable. Actually, also coincidentally today, a band, a Leeds-based band, have sent me a little clip of the new single that they're putting out. They haven't just sent it to me. They've sent it to everybody on social media. And the, the footage that they've used for their video um, clip is basically somebody dancing on my car on the Friday night of promotion. <laughs> <laughs> so they've, they've sent me, they've linked me to it. And so I'm looking at this guy in these bright pink shorts dancing first on the bonnet, which I knew about, and then on the roof, which I saw from the upstairs in the East Stand. That was the, my catalyst for going, right, I've got to get out there. But I don't move my car quite soon. But when I see these scenes that they've shot car level, there's absolute chaos going, what was I thinking of? Why did I even go and rescue my car through the crowd and ask everybody to part like the Red Sea as I reverse <laughs> the car through thousands of people, thousands of crazy people outside of Ellen Road? So on that basis, 360 quid seems a fairly reasonable return for those who were parked either side of me who, who took their cars home in a small box about, that, about yay big. Um, <laughs> Because they were done. They were done. So, not yet, but the process is, it, it, it's a work in progress. Brilliant. I was uh, going to ask a question for Tony, but uh, actually, Jared Thompson uh, has put in a good one here um, for the speakers. Do we see any of the younger members of the current squad emerging as leaders of the future? I think that's a really good question. Who would like to answer that one? Uh, I will, yeah. I think... Uh, going up to the Premier League, I'm sure we'll get on to a bit of recruitment and what have you, but it's quite well. clear. 
uh, yeah, it's quite clear we're going to need uh, quality. You know, absolutely. I think Bills has already stated uh, he doesn't like uh, quantity, doesn't want a, you know, a load of players. He'll always want to have one or two players in play different positions, but we need uh, some quality, uh, and that's going to be important. Yet the youngsters, I think, will still have a role to play, you know, absolutely, and, and filling those gaps and coming on. But I, I think it's, um, it's a step up that uh, is going to be bigger than, than people think. I think there's a lot of levels in that Premier League as well. And the goal has to be uh, to find three worse teams than, than us to start. And then you can raise your, your goals from there. Of course, we want to you know, be challenging for Europe, et cetera, et cetera. But you just look at what's happened. I think it's the two out of every three teams that go up, they come straight back down. So this is not an easy and achievable thing uh, to do. So when you talk about the youngsters uh, and leading the side, you know, putting them in at this point in time is going to be uh, more difficult. So I, I think we'll have uh, some experienced players coming in, but I, I still do think that we will get those players, the young boys, uh, the stroke as, as uh, we saw. Uh, I think um, certainly other uh, other players to try and get in and get an opportunity and stay in the team. I think that's going to be difficult, uh, simply because nowadays, if you look back years and years ago, you'd, a young boy would get a young player would get an opportunity. If you're 18, 19, like, like I was at Aston Villa, uh, the Aston Villa won the European Cup. So they were the best team in Europe. And the breakdown of that sign uh, happened because a lot of players started to get older. And suddenly an 18-year-old Aussie kid suddenly said, yeah, let's give him a go. He looks quite good. And they put me in the first team. And suddenly three, four, five, six, seven games later, I adjusted and I, I started to do very, very well. Forget the six, seven, eight games adjustment period. You haven't got that now. Four games, losers. The manager sat. So why would you go and put this skinny Aussie kid in? I'm not going to. I'm going to go and buy someone for X amount because he's got experience and I know he can do a job to a certain level. So that's that's going to be always the challenge uh, with younger players at the moment. So hence why the loan system now and going out and playing at different clubs is gigantic and absolutely vital. And that's why when someone said to me, or actually, sorry, someone mentioned earlier about uh, Ben White, you know, why didn't he play at Brighton? Well, didn't he go out to, I think, Somewhere, then he went to Peterborough for a year, yeah. and then he came to Leeds United, and now he's a 20, 30 million defender. They'll have him back now, and they'll put him in their first team. So that's how it seems to, to work these days. So the youngsters we've got, yes, I think as a progression uh, of a young player's career, Leeds is a good opportunity because if the opportunity there, they do progress and they do get to the first team, we're, we're known for that. But now with the step up, it's going to be that much more difficult. Do you think we'll see any of our younger players going out on loan um, <laughs> like that? Yeah, actually, I'll probably Popey knows more, but I think is it uh, Edmondson might be off to Aberdeen, I think, but that seems to be the latest. Yeah, so. yeah, I think Graham Smith was reporting that today. I mean, look, I think he was he was pretty set himself on going out on loan this last season and Marcelo, I think we said this in the last meeting we had, wasn't it, that Marcelo felt very much that he was part of keeping the squad on its toes and was really valuable in training but for his own development I think like for what Tony said there I think he, he's got to go out on and he's he's not even featured on the bench has he at all so where where does he fit down the line for, for Marcelo if at all you wonder but certainly there's he's got something otherwise he would have just put him on the scrap pile at the beginning you know when he, when he made his decisions um, there's, look, now they've gone to the Premier League, you do one of them. Will it stop that flow of, of the local talent coming through? I, I think there's some great players. I mean, Oli Casey, I know we've only seen him in, ter in the first team shirt when he came on against Huddersfield. Thought he looked really, really composed. Further down the line, I think Charlie Cresswell, Rich Richard's, uh, I think it's his eldest lad, uh, one or two that's at the pub. He's a real prospect. But, you know, you're talking Premier League now, so... In a way, that probably limits the chance. You know, they've got to be super, super talented, haven't they, to, to sort of get through now into the pool. But if anybody's going to do it, it would be Marcelo because he has created this aspirational corridor, has he not, um, which loads of people are travelling along. I mean, like we look at Jamie Shackleton as a young player, but, you know, he's actually, in terms of appearances, he's had a season now. You know, he's in, his, in the 40s with his appearances and looking better and better by the game, isn't he, uh, when he's come on and influenced and obviously scored his goals now too. So, so I think it will continue. He won't be afraid to put people on, on, on the bench, I think. But it's, it, naturally, it's going to get harder for people to step up and make the grade because, you know, going from Championship to the Premier League. But it will still be there. And I think going back to Bryn's point, 
the progression will happen if Marcelo stays because he is so wedded to the idea, as he always says, I want a squad of 18 and, you know, a handful of youngsters to go with it. And therefore, you know, the academy is going to be vital as long as he's there. And obviously they've got big plans for it going forward anyway. Now it's gone up to category one. So it will still happen, but I just think it'll be that little bit harder for players to break through. We've got another really good question here from Jay Scadlin, which is one of the ones that we had as well. Um, where do we need to strengthen in the squad next season? And will Bielsa's liking of a small squad be a risk in the Premier League? That's a really good question. Um, who'd like to answer that one? Bryn, Tony? Uh, well, I'll, go, I'll jump in first. The small squad is a risk, but it's definitely the way it's going to work because he's made it work very well this year. I mean, when we were having conversations before the start of the season, Tony and I had one of them. Uh, we discussed it in the last get together about the kind of a degree of concern that the squad wasn't going to be big enough. He didn't have enough players in, in certain positions, central defender being a key one where he thought he's only got two central defenders in the squad. And this lad, Ben White, we've never heard of. And he went through the entire season. We were completely wrong. And Marcelo Bielsa was completely right. So no problem <laughs> there. Um, but he, he, as Adam says, you'll keep the same size of squad, I suspect. Where the young players become a massive potential advantage is they're over and above what he will want. They're extras. They could be real bonuses, particularly if they can come in and make an impact as they have done at times this season. Um, so that saves you having to sign more players anyway if you've got that group of players with this level of first-team experience waiting in the wings. Uh, I think he's got to strengthen through the middle of the team, basically. I mean, it, it, I, I wouldn't, I don't think Ben White will stay. I think, I don't think he'll stay at Brighton either. I think he'll go. I still think there's a big move for him somewhere, a bigger move than Leeds. Because remember, Leeds are a big club, but not a big club in Premier League terms. There's a lot to be earned on that basis still for Leeds United. So big support doesn't really mean a great deal in the Premier League now. You know, you, you've got to step it up on every other level apart from that. And Leeds have got a lot of catching up to do because they've been out of it a long, long time. It's changed immeasurably in the time they've been out. So they've got to they've got to get players in through the middle of the team for me. They need a goalkeeper. I don't think Casir will stay. I think Melier is too young. I think they're definitely obviously going to need another central defender to replace White. They're probably going to need another central midfielder and they're definitely going to need another striker because Pat Bamford's put in a great um, effort this season. Um, but you need at least another backup a backup striker of reputation, of some sort of reputation. So I would say maybe four, I'd look at it and maybe say maybe four, maximum five new faces would arrive. That would be my guess. Um, I, would, uh, I would agree with you, Bryn. Sorry, just, just briefly, yeah, I would, I would agree that uh, it does need to be uh, around the five mark. The only concern next season, of course, is with five substitutions uh, allowed. Uh, you know, you've suddenly got teams like Man City, Liverpool, you know, looking at their bench full of internationals and bringing on five players to change the course of the game completely. And if we don't have that sort of quality or one or two in quantity, then I think we are always going to be uh, hamstrung to a point. So I think that new ruling uh, certainly doesn't help us. It helps the big boys a lot. Brilliant. Thanks for that. And Rob, do you want to pick some out on the uh, chat? No, he doesn't. Right, so how much are Popey and Bryn looking forward to the Premier League press facilities next year? Is this going to be from Gary? Well, Bryn, okay. you've had a taste of it, haven't you? With, with I Sky. know what it's all about. Yeah. I know what it's all about. I, I was there until fairly recently, yeah. I mean, your Arsenal experience with the, 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 uh, the, tray, the, the room full of cake, basically. I mean, you know, <laughs> not just one... Not just one type of cake, but five or six different types of cake to choose from. That's the norm, my friend. That is the norm. It's like, it's like yes. that everywhere you go. Even Bournemouth <laughs> off, your, off your three types of cake. Um, <laughs> I mean, that's one of the areas. Wait, Ser wait serious to get to... Yeah. Uh, no, go, on. go on, Tony. Well, it's one of the serious no, no, points. I just said, wait, wait to get to... <laughs> wait to get to Stamford Bridge. You can have a three-course meal, for goodness sake. It is amazing. It's funny, you, you end up picking your games when you know the food's really good. I wouldn't say <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, there's not much there, but apart from that, it's all good. And you're right, Arsenal, I just remember free Ben and Jerry's as a fridge, and you just go and take as much ice cream as you want. Right, that's enough of my technical speak. Go on, Bryn, carry on. <laughs> well, there's a serious point that underpins all of this in that Leeds media facilities, as Adam will testify, 
have mm. very much fallen below <laughs> the, uh, the yeah. uh, expected standards, frankly, even at championship level, I would say, on this basis, because there's been a kind of underinvestment on that basis over the years. Maybe when you had an owner who doesn't really like the media, you'd hardly expect them to spend much money on anything other than kind of dry, curly sandwiches. So the, 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 the facilities for the media are going to have to be dramatically, dramatically improved at Ellen Road. And that's one of the first tasks that they've got to undertake. Because, you know, the media are going to be in from day one. Fans won't be, but the media will be. So there's been a new, a me, a new media. LUTV have been shifted out of current um, facilities and a new media suite is going into where LUTV is. There's key things around the tunnel that you have to do in the Premier League now that when Leeds left the Premier League, you didn't have to do. But you need, you're supposed to have six interview spaces uh, in the tunnel for the post-match interviews because you've got foreign broadcasters coming in to cover stuff now. And Leeds will be well covered by foreign broadcasters because the mm. Argentinians are coming, if nobody else. But Spanish-speaking countries will want to cover Leeds United. So there's going to be a lot of extra attention on that basis. So you've got to find space. Ellen Road is a very old stadium. And the West Stand, where most of the business is done, mm. you know, it is has not really been touched since the Revy era, frankly. There's not an awful lot being done there. Euro uh, 96 was the only time they did any major work on it recently. So they've got so much work to do. They've got to create these new interview areas in the tunnel, um, the whole thing has just got to, you're not even talking one level. The media facilities have got to go up two, three, four, five levels now. Um, and they've got to build a compound for the outside broadcasters in the car park. I mean, it's big time now. It's big time. This is the key to be enjoyed, but it's a challenge as well. Yeah. And right, just go on, on, on what Bryn's saying there. You know, I've, while we mentioned Stamford Bridge as well with Tony, um, when Ken Bates was in charge, of course, we were very much restricted as what we could do. And it, one of the, the benefits of me is that I went and had to get my football sort of elsewhere for a little while. And I worked for an Irish station quite a bit called Today FM and they covered the Premier League. So I managed to go to a lot of the grounds and, and see what it's like. And Bryn is right. You are talking a different level and not just on, on the press front. You, you, you know, this is like a different stratosphere that they've got to be ready for. And I think the plan, the plan is in place. That's one thing this current regime have got. They've got big plans on how to move forward and obviously the stadium development and what have you. But, um, but yeah, I'm looking forward to, to sort of, you know, going around the big grounds. I think there's one thing as well that we're always quite conscious of as well with being commentators and reporters is that, look, at the end of the day, you know, we're there. If we, I always treat it as a bonus if we get, you know, something nice like a sandwich or whatever. Or, you know, I always treat it like that because I know people are paying an arm and a leg in the ground, you know, to, to get the same or less or, or hopefully something a bit better. But it's really noticeable when you go to certain clubs that the first impression and, and with the press, it does count because, you know, your nationals might turn up once every, you know, Sheffield flood at Ellen Road when they were going through difficult times. If they're treated badly or just feel a bit disrespected or what have you, then, you know, like, it's got to influence how they write, definitely, or what they say. And, and you're so right there, Ben, about when you've got an owner that doesn't really care too much for the press, then you treat them bad, they ain't going to treat you well, are they? So it sort of goes hand in glove. If you want a professional outfit, a top flight outfit, then everything's got to be top flight. And, and I'm sure Leeds will get there. They've just got a really short turnaround time, which is going to hamper the things like the floodlights. Even the pitch, I mean, you know, Bryn mentions 1996 there. That pitch, I think, was laid in 1995. So it's, and it's well out of date, apparently. It's like three or four, four or five years out of date. It's not even the Decian style that you that you meant to have these days. So those grounds people are doing a fantastic job to get that pitch into the state it's been this year. It's been been amazing to be quite honest. So all those things have got to push forward, not just the press facilities too. So a lot of your not lots of your money, but quite a bit of your money from you going to the Premier League has to get spent on just getting the you know the structure right and ready to to be Premier League ready. Thanks for that. Right, so I'm going to combine Phil Fraser and Michael Cooper's questions of the Foots panel. So realistically, where do the panel see Leeds finishing in the league next season? Um, and will we finish above Everton? <laughs> 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 uh, right, I'll, I'll go first for that one. Above Everton, that's going to be uh, a tough ask. Um, where do I think we're going to finish up? I don't think we'll be in the bottom three. I don't think the next two or three above that, I don't think we'll be there either. I think in that next group, I think that's where we'll be. I think we'll be okay, uh, but always looking just slightly behind us rather than in front. I, I hope I'm very much wrong 
Uh, and also, I think you can ask me again when the, the recruitment's uh, over and finished. Uh, but at this point in time, um, that's where I'll be absolutely delighted with that. That would be a, a really good first step. Uh, I'd say that um, finishing above Evan again, you know, that would actually maybe be a, a, the way Evan look at the moment. Sorry, Ad, bit of a mess. <laughs> um, that might actually be kind of a benchmark, you know, position for Leeds to aim at in a sense. Because if Evan are going to be maybe hovering around the mid-table position, you want to be there or thereabouts. What you want really, I think, is enough points on the board with six or seven games to go that you. Well, actually, what you want is a, as many points on the board as early as possible. I've seen this in previous situations where people like Bradford went up. You, know, you need a good start to the season. Mm. You've got to get, if you, even if it's, the, if it's draws here and there, you've got to get points on the board. It just releases some of the pressure later on. When the pressure in the Premier League, one of the key things players have to deal with in the Premier League, the big difference for me with the Championship is the pressure on every single game when you move into the Premier League is I would liken it to playing an FA Cup, say, you know, a big FA Cup fifth, sixth round tie every week, every Tuesday, every Saturday, whatever. Because every game has that sense. And you see teams who get promoted celebrating, going mad at the end of a victory, you know, in September or whatever. Well, actually, you don't really want that situation. You want it to become the norm rather than this big deal that we finally won a game or we've won one in the last five or whatever it might be. So you want to take a little of that out of the, the element of sort of mad celebration out of it because you you want regularly. And if you if you if Leeds like Sheffield United, perfect example in Sheffield United, who I've watched in Chip, and then I watched in the Premier League, they played the same way, pretty very similar approach to Leeds for me. They play the full backs up high, you know, centre halves will score goals from inside the opposition six yard box. Of the, they're very adventurous in the way they play, but they're very well organised defensively. And they have had a brilliant season. Chris Wilder has done a fantastic job with Sheffield United to make it so comfortable for them with pretty much the same squad he had in League One, never mind the Championship, number of the same names that he's added to a bit with some good quality, like we've just been discussing. But the way they've handled the Premier League is the example for Leeds to, to, to follow for me. They've kept doing the same things, largely with the same group, stuck mm -hmm. at it, and they've had this fantastic return on it. Um, so, will Leeds, having said all of that, I think it's going to be. I think it's going to be very tough for Leeds. And the big challenge for them will be: can they do in games next season what they did in games this season? The answer is you would anticipate probably not. So, when they can't dominate games like they have done this year, how do they react to that? And how do they absorb pressure that hasn't really been on them defensively for a lot of this year? Keepers mm -hmm. have hardly had a shot to save this season. You can't imagine that's going to be the same next season. But having grown up, well, having been born in Liverpool and uh, with a father who's a Liverpool fan, I desperately hope Leeds finish above Everton because it's totally <laughs> <more places. laughs> Well, having <laughs> been born in Liverpool and being an Everton <laughs> fan, quite clearly. Uh, but I don't, Brian, I'm, I'm sure with you in terms of Leeds' position, to, I think it'll be the upper end of the bottom third. So um, I'd like to think that it'll be reasonably comfortable but I think I think that the really pertinent I've noticed with the watch Premier League football is like Bryn says every game every minute every game counts I mean it's just you just don't get away with anything you know the margins are just so fine so I think Leeds will be yeah sort of the higher part of the of the bottom third if you like I think like Leeds, I think in Ancelotti, you know, Everton have got a card-carrying manager and I, I've got like quite high hopes really for, for Everton as a club and on the pitch, I think things will improve providing that they go with him. So I doubt, I don't think Leeds will finish above Everton and that's trying to be logical about it going forward because uh, I think both teams have got like exceptionally good managers. Um, but I, yeah, if you look at the plan, it's to like sort of stick in there for three years and then attack the top six or get to, a, that's basically what Andrea said so far. And you've got to say, oh, yes, there's been mistakes on the way, but his, his rhetoric has been matched by action. Um, so the key, obviously, is keeping Marcelo. From that point, if that's secured, I'm really confident Leeds will stay in the division next season. I didn't realise Kenny Dalglish had spoke to Andrea about Leeds. I only found that out recently. And just what we have to thank yeah. for him for that conversation that has led to everything that's come through since then. I, I thought it was such a great story. Uh, with Kenny, anyway. Yeah, that um, was basically that was a conversation. Wasn't which club should I buy? Oh, you want to look at Leeds? Yeah. No, just that, that was basically. Yeah, yeah. 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 Bye, then. Thanks, yeah. Kenny. <laughs> 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 oh, that's fabulous. Uh, Matt, do you want to choose a question for the panel? 
Yeah, so the question here, so, you know, take into account player recruitment, um, the structural changes that need to be done to Mid to Ellen Road, uh, obviously bringing in the prawn sandwiches. Now, is it, is it an advantage or a disadvantage, do you think, in terms of the, the quick t- turnaround of the season? Is that, is that an advantage or a disadvantage? Uh, who wants to take that one? Uh, go, I think it's a huge disadvantage. I, I think it's, a, you know, to, to try and uh, suddenly go from a championship side to Premier League in such a short space of time. And we mentioned all the infrastructure. I was actually down at the ground, say, a couple of days ago, and the architect was there. He was actually doing all the LUTV stuff for him and the studios and what have you. And he said, well, all he could do before was a few hand drawings. And so that the plans aren't even drawn up properly yet. That's what he was there for two days ago. To actually to go through the plans that he's then going to draw up. So all this stuff that needs to get done, I think, is a is a problem. I think we need two Sky Studios. He's saying no chance for two at the start of the season. We're going to have one at best, and then we build on that. So, so if you take that to every part of the club and the recruitment and what have you, it's it's difficult. You know, you need as much time as you can. And and when that gap, I think, is just so so much bigger than what anyone has been used to. Uh, more time, you know, has to be better. So uh, it's going to be an absolute challenge. I think physically as well, um, the turnaround for a player uh, is difficult. You know, that's why the boys are letting their hair down. I mean, the only testing they're having is uh, is breathalyzer at the moment. That is it. You know, they got <laughs> to quickly get back to the UK, and they know they know they're going to get run their socks off. You know, when they start training again, they understand all that. But I think that mental release. It's so very important. When that gap is so short, you know, I remember when I was playing, you then go play for England, you end up having like a three-week gap and they expect you to go back into pre-season training and I would always try and get a, a three-week holiday. I would relax in that second week. Finally, I get to the third week. I'm sick of the family. Now I want to go back to uh, training. But if you don't get that gap, it is very difficult. So that's what the players are doing, exactly what they should be doing. But they also know as soon as they get back, well, it's going to be hard work, and, but it's a, such an exciting thing to get back to. So uh, stay in the moment, enjoy what you've just achieved, absolutely. Then suddenly, during, after the trip, the focus will change and off we go. But I, back to your question, I just think the longer that process was, it would have been, would have been better for sure. I completely agree. So I'll put, sorry, Rob, interrupt, interrupted. But um, I completely agree, actually. I think especially when it comes to player recruitment, we all know we need to strengthen, especially in the middle of the team, the spire of the team. Um, and there's a question here from Phil Fraser, actually. I, I'm, I've not seen this article yet, but Phil here did a piece on the, the Athletic apparently this morning, summarising the possible signings. Um, have you guys heard anything? Who's on the radar right now? <laughs> That's the that? rumours. <laughs> yeah, I mean, look, I mean, firstly... Like it's always been the way with Leeds, hasn't it? That there's, it, it, look, if the rumours are all true, Leeds would have a squad of two hundred, wouldn't they? Sitting on on the bench for every game. Um, look, if you go, if just combining the last question with this one, I thought there'd be a small advantage in the quick turnaround for keeping someone like Ben White, but I think as Bryn said, that looks like that could be that could well slip away that one, um, because of one of the so-called bigger boys being around. And I just thought that would be an advantage in terms of. Um, someone that knows that he'd get first in football that leads in the Premier League, knows what to expect from Bielsa, clean fit, straight in, if Leeds could match the price, whatever. But, hey, I don't think that's going to happen. So that maybe not quite the advantage I, I thought. But coming, going forward, and who do they need to sign and who can they sign? I mean, there's the lad, Jonathan David, aren't they? And, and I think a keeper... Is, is absolutely essential because I'm not sure if Cassie is going to stay at the club, but the club haven't said anything really where they stand since the, the judgment came down. But I think Melier, great, but he's young, but they need somebody there. Somebody's talked about Joe Hart, whether that would fit. I don't think that fit Bielsa's style because I'm not quite sure he's good enough with his feet, to be quite honest. But if you, if you were to ask me for one position, if they were limited to one position for big, big money, I'd have to go with a striker because... Yeah. I'm a big fan of Patrick Bamford, but that's the one thing that's going to be the difference here is converting those chances. Leeds will not be short of creating chances, we know that, because of the way they play. Um, yes, they'll probably get a little bit less going up in the Premier League, but they need somebody who's absolutely you know, ready to stick that ball in the net. And unfortunately, that's what Chelsea has start to do for Southampton towards the end of the season. But you know, you're looking at at least that calibre of player, I think. 
We don't know yet whether they're going to be stuck with Augustin because of the, the legal situation, whether he does come back and whether he becomes a Leeds player or whether an agreement's reached or whatever. Leipzig like, can determine that that deal is rock solid. Um, we'll have to wait and see. But that's what I would want to see. If you were to give me one signing that I have to make, then it would be that one. The turnaround is a, an issue um, potentially in terms of the short turnaround because you've got a manager who wants players who can play in the way that he plays. So mm. you've seen like Helder Costa didn't go straight into the first team, despite the fact he was kind of last season, last summer's big signing, effectively, in terms of the value anyway. He had to wait for a few weeks, months, before he became something like a first team regular because there was a process of getting to know the system, getting to know how you work. Augustan didn't manage to do that by any mm. stretch of the imagination. So, boom, off he went. And you've now got here, got um, it's going to be, what, four weeks that the players have got by the time they come back? So anyone you put into the group has got four weeks to get to know the Bielsa way, if you like. And that makes it trickier for Leeds this year than it ever would have been previously because not only have you got this very specific way of working day in, day out, not just on the pitch either, but you've also got less time than you've ever had before as well. So it suddenly becomes quite a challenge to me to get everything in place in that period, which is why he's more likely to ultimately err on the group he's already got still, I think. Just a, a quick one about the, uh, the transfer rumours as well. We'll look at it from the other side as well. If I was an agent of a player, I'd tell you what, my player is getting linked with Leeds United. Absolutely. Because it's, it's the obvious point, isn't it, to try and whether to boost your, your salary at your present club or wherever you are. So we're going to get linked with all sorts of different players. Um, I actually did a piece early this morning for uh, Australian TV. And the first thing they asked me was, so is Ibrahimovic coming? No. <laughs> Ibrahimovic, Zlatan, I think, oh my God, here we go. You know, then they go, why not? Why isn't he coming? I mean, oh my God. Firstly, you know, talk about a non Bielsa player, that would be Ibrahimovic. Because our style, and, that, and this is go back to the Brim's point, our style is very, very particular. So that player, uh, you know, has to have such mobility up the top to, to close people down. That's his first job when he hasn't got the ball. Uh, Ibra at 38, God bless him, you know, isn't going to be running around according to Bielsa's uh, tactics. That's not going to work. But we're going to get certainly um, uh, put with lots of other other players uh, throughout this period. But this short turnaround is, is difficult. The window will go on uh, quite deep into the season, which is, is quite strange. But uh, there's no doubt we've had plan A and plan B. Victor Orta would have had you know, a whole list of players. But to get all that business done quickly is going to be difficult. Some clubs have already done some great business. But you've got to realise what you're up against here. You know, we, uh, I just look at my old club, Chelsea. They just got Timo Werner, who I think is an 80, 90 million striker. They got him for 50, 55 million or something, brother. Kai Havertz is going to come for only 70 million. They got Zayek from uh, Ajax. It, it, you're talking crazy numbers. And then you've got to work your way down the league. And then suddenly we've got to try and compete with that. So uh, it's going to be a challenge. Yeah, and I think also, Tony, there, like, Let's see what the what the chairman said is that it's going to be very much more along the Sheffield United model than the Aston Villa model when it comes to spends. Straight away, you know, you're in that pool that you're talking about then, aren't you? Now, Ollie Watkins is the name that's come up quite a lot, and I know it was mentioned today by Phil in the Athletic. There's a player that's been transformed from one position to another, and it's done such a, that would appeal to Bielsa. There's no doubt, but of course, they're in a situation of where they're going to be. You know, they've got a playoff final to to get involved in as well going forward. So, yeah, a lot of these are these deals ready to go if, if they want some or say if Brentford didn't make it does Watkins become immediately available for Leeds to go and, 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 and pounce upon Let's see. but I'd imagine that's the sort of player that he would sort of go for if needs be but I don't think his demands will be that great I, I'm, I'm with, with the guys here he will go for maybe a handful of players but but fundamentally a squad that's already there and ready to, he's already talked about players in that squad he says no they'll be able to cope with it they'll be able to step up to the Premier League He's he's got pretty much full faith in a lot of those first teams. So I don't think we'll see a radically different squad go into this for the first game of next season. Right, thanks for that, guys. Um, there's quite a good question here from David, actually, because it seems less likely that there will be fans at Ellen Road next season due to COVID. Does this have a significant effect on the revenues and, and transfer, Kitty? Is that how it works in the Premier League? Do you understand the question? What, what do you think? 
It does have a significant uh, impact, but it doesn't have as, as significant an impact as it would do in the championship. In fact, nothing mm -hmm. like as significant an impact because the higher you get, the Premier League takes away the necessity for selling tickets in many ways because tickets become a useful add-on to that. I mean, there is an impact in terms of all the other revenue that you build around it, the corporate stuff, the how much business mm -hmm. the shop does on a match day, that type of thing. But the actual act of being in the Premier League takes a lot of the pressure off the ticket selling thing, which seems yeah. bizarre. But that's because there's so much that you know that's that's because there's so much extra money. The broadcast deal is so huge in the Premier League that you can play games in front of an empty stadium and not lose and not lose any money, frankly. So um, Championship, I mean, that was an extra imperative on Leeds getting promoted this year because the way the year the season turned out. You fear for those clubs left behind in the championship now because if they've got an extended period now of not having people in stadia, well, they got through this bit and everyone did a brilliant job to get through these last nine games in the championship. All the issues were sorted by one currently, so that was well done, everybody. But there's a huge financial reckoning to come for these clubs if this now is an extended into a new, you know, into mm. a long way into a new season. But thankfully, Leeds have left that behind, so that becomes less of an imperative. So there's an impact in terms of the atmosphere around the game, but Leeds would be able to function as a football club without the crowds. LUTV became a massive source of income for Leeds over the last few weeks because we had these four exclusive games that weren't on Sky, for which we got sort of really good viewing figures, and that brought significant money into the club. Not significant in Premier League terms, by the way, but significant in terms of day-to-day -day running costs at Championship level terms. So all that pressure is taken away now, and you know, it, it, hopefully, we get people in in October in some in some numbers because it's just a better. Listen, I think we may talk about this yet, but it's just a better experience. It, it's a weird old. Uh, Adam can say, Tony can say, we've all uh, been in these empty stadia yeah. now, and it's a weird old. It's a weird thing. You get into into the zone when you're doing the commentaries, so you kind of you don't miss it as much, but. Every now and again, you stop and you and you go, oh, this is strange, isn't it? I mean, yeah, <laughs> could not agree more, Bryn, especially as those games wore on and became more definitive as well. It was really noticeable. Um, I think, and also on, on the point, I do agree, Bryn, there about fans coming in. But fans are a lifeblood of, of a club. I, I get it. You know, without the fans, the clubs don't exist. But in terms of the monetary, you know, import, it, it is less significant in the Premier League. And funny enough, Andrea Radrazzani said to us the other day, he said that already, he said just the whole COVID has cost the club 30 to 40 million in, in revenue. So going into the Premier League is obviously going to alleviate that uh, uh, like big style. Those left behind, it's going to re really, really hurt. And Angus said to us, Angus Kinnear, the chief executive said to us the other day, he said, look, we have sailed close to the FFP parameter. And, he, and I asked him, I said, look, promotion how much has that relieved the pressure and he said enormously it's it's really has just taken the valve and released it that well not a little bit but significantly so because the multiples are just so much bigger sponsorship everything else you know the adidas stuff everything is just he, he says straight away leeds will go into the top third of the premier league in terms of um what where they are as a commercial uh, uh, entity if you like they can capitalize on that wow over the next two or three years and well literally the sky's the limit isn't it for them what does it mean for the players going into the premier league from you know the championship wage structure are they in for like oh. the world's biggest ever payday going in i mean what does that look like for the players i've always been, just been quite interested to know tony's got to answer that because adam and i earn oh. buttons from the jobs <laughs> we do <laughs> yeah <laughs> well it in uh, a lot of respects, it, it's how their, their, obviously their contracts are structured, you know, simple as that, and how they negotiated with the club uh, about that. So um, if you have a, a decent agent, there's no doubt that you should, uh, certainly with promotion, you know, your, your contract will go up quite significantly, depending on uh, the level of the player coming in as well. You know, some players have it tied to the top earner, so you have to be within X amount of the top earner of the club. So anyone that has got that, which I don't think, I doubt any of the Leeds players have, but if you have, you want Ibrahimovic to come in. Come on, Slatan, come in, because <laughs> my wage is earning oh, right close to you. Um, no, I think everything you know goes through the roof. And, and the ones that I think even haven't got that in, they will be rewarded you know, with, with their, their new contracts and, uh, and, and off they go. But yeah, it's, it's quite significant. And I would have bet from, from my day to, to now, I think if the gap is possible, gigantically more so uh, I think the boys can uh, yeah, look forward to, to, to moving house wherever they would like in the country uh, and they'll be fine. 
I hope the same happens with LUTV, by the way. <laughs> as does, well, actually, as does actually Tony. Britain, you know when you said, I certainly do, you know when you said we had 400,000 more revenue and those last four games were the biggest, I thought it was just to see me and you, to listen to our voices. <laughs> now you're telling me the games weren't shown elsewhere. You have burst my bubble. <laughs> but yeah, however, I can't wait because even doing LUTV, I know this sounds silly, but I could be standing in the corner with a microphone and the, the little foam thing at the top is filthy dirty. And I said to the guy, can I have, you've got another one of these? He said, no, we, we can't have another one. And also, don't hold it with two hands because inside there's this battery and it touches the side and it shorts out and we can't afford to get another one. I'm thinking, oh, come on, guys. I can't even have a clean top. Your microphone doesn't bloody work. What the hell is going on? <laughs> so really, we can only hope we can only hope. <laughs> right, well, guys, we're coming to the end really now. I suppose we have to look forward to the Premier League. What fixtures are we mo I'm looking forward to Leeds versus Man U because my first ever game was Leeds versus Man U in the semi final of the Rumble Oaks Cup when I was 10. Um, and my ears were ringing at the end, and it's just a memory that's imprinted on me. Um, so, what fixtures are we most looking forward to? And, Tony, can you share any memories? of some of these big games that we can look forward to? Any, any inside stories you can share with us to, to wrap up? Well, uh, I'll, I'll just briefly, you, you mentioned there about Manchester United, and I have to say, my abiding memory when we played against Manchester United at Ellen Road was that when we go into the, the players' tunnel before we go out on the pitch, uh, you know, the, the music starts and you can hear the crowd, you know, start to get excited and the hairs in the back of the your neck, you know, would, would stand out. When it was Manchester United, the atmosphere, I swear on my life, was, you could always cut it with a knife. It was that thick and intimidating. And, and I, I keep saying that I'm five foot nine, but when I run out, I'm like seven foot tall. Man United, I'm like a 50 foot tall tree running out there. It was like ridiculous. The noise was just incredible. So Manchester United is going to be the obvious one. Um, Chelsea, obviously my old team, I, I quite like to see them, uh, those uh, two go at it as well. Everyone keeps telling me when I first signed for Leeds um, that they obviously they hate Chelsea and the 70s and all that kind of history as well. But that's the beauty, isn't it? Because of these big sides, we have got lots of history with them. So there'll be so many um, you know, good opportunities. And just, just very briefly as well about Chelsea. Um, wouldn't it be funny if like a betting company did like a quite an amusing ad about the manager there and the, the maybe spying on the training ground or something. I'm not saying anything. I'm not saying it's already <laughs> happened and there's been shot and I'm involved in it in any sort of way. I'm just putting that out there for the group, okay? Thanks, <laughs> Tony. Uh, what about you yeah, guys, Brent? Well, I'd say Manchester United. It's the obvious answer. And I'll say it for pretty much the same reasons as Tony, but I was sitting in the stand, not, not running up the tunnel. But I did. Uh, I was lucky enough to commentate on for Radio Leeds to commentate on the game where Leeds beat Man United. I think Dave Weatherall scored the header, mm -hmm. and it was the first time Leeds had beaten Manchester United at Ellen Road in an awfully long time. And like Tony said, I mean, it was it's the only game I I really actually been to in England. I think where the fans start coming in two hours before kickoff, and you could actually hear from inside the stadium when the Manchester United team bus arrived outside the stadium because of the noise that there was outside the ground as well as even by that point inside the ground. It's that level of intensity. That's the one game. And for people, to an extent, for people like Adam, and I don't mean this in a kind of patronising way, but, but it's that this is the experience that lots of Leeds fans over these last 16 years have missed. This is the bit mm. that you've missed. This is where the big boys ride in, into town and you meet them as equals. So not an FA Cup tie away at Old Trafford or anything. You meet as equals now. So you've got to match them as equals as well. But the atmosphere that goes along with that fixture is just next level. So I very, very much look forward to that one. Yeah, that, that's definitely the one that, that I want is Manchester United at Ellen Road for, I just want it to be as hostile as it can be imaginable because that's the thing that I always say to people who say, well, what are Leeds going to be in the Premier League? And I say, well, it is, it's that edge and that sort of, <laughs> that old, passion 70s 80s sort of football atmosphere isn't it 
in a sort of modern day style without the, 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 the nastier elements, if you like. That's what's so good about it. And that's what all the other <laughs> Premier League uh, clubs have missed. I mean, all, you know, my family, as you know, they're all Evertonians and they really miss it. And much as, and I always say, as much as people, you know, they love to hate Leeds, whatever, they, they, they love the schadenfreude of all the bad stuff that's happened over the, over the last few years, but they actually can't wait to have you know, leads because it makes the Premier League strong. And that's why I'm glad that Aston Villa have stayed up as well. Not not because I'm pleased with how they've conducted themselves, but it's just a better Premier League because with them and Leeds in it. The other game, obviously, I think it'd be Percy for me to Goodison. And I hope both these games, Everton against Leeds, Leeds against Manchester United, are when the crowds are back because I think they'll be really special. I remember referee Howard Webb telling me, a long time, well, quite a few years, he said the most intimidating place to referee was at Goodison. And while we've still got the old stadium there, I think much like Elder Road, I think you've got that old-fashioned sort of, you know, hostile crowd, you know, literally baying for blood. I think that'd be great. But obviously for me personally, that'd be, a, you know, to hear Zed Carls and then, and then see Leeds sneak it 3-2 or something like that. Like they did when they last came up out of the... Uh, going to have to cheer, Adam, if we do. Yeah, <laughs> well, hey, I'm, I'm a professor. It's weird. People ask, how can you, how do you feel about Leeds? And, and it's not, and they say the same with Phil Hay. And then obviously Bryn's got, you know, Wrexham. Well, Phil Hay's a Hearts fan. But you just get this massively deep affinity when you've been around the club for so long. And you like to think you understand it. And, and you know, Bryn's in his second spell with it. And... You know, it was not that long ago he was doing it with God bless with Norman Hunter. You know, back in the in the nineties when you know Leeds were starting to, um, well, they were going through a bit of change. We say at the time, weren't they? But you know, I listened back to the the Yeboah goals and all the atmosphere that, that when Bryn's commentating on that goal for, for Radio <laughs> Leeds at the time, it's absolutely you know to get those days and nights back. And we've had glimpses, haven't we? Um, and particularly in the last couple of years, too, with some of the great atmospheres, Aston Villa away, Blackburn at home when that winner went in. You know, you just get that that glimpse of it. Um, yeah, to get those back and look, I think it's going to be the other side of Christmas, to be quite honest. But to get them back in some format would be amazing. But I really do hope those two games are when crowds are back, because um, Ben's right, we've we've missed it, and, and and Tony's right. You ride the crowd, and especially at Leeds, to fuel your performance and your lesson without it right i think we should wrap up there then guys i think um we've overrun a little bit we've got loads more questions to ask but um we can't keep here all day i just want to say massive thanks to tony dorigo thanks tony um thanks once again lovely um, no problems yeah. at all thank you we're off by the way we're playing good promoter <laughs> yeah <laughs> well, um, Adam, thanks a lot, Adam. Uh, I know you're on holiday, so, you know, thank you very much for joining no, us. I enjoyed it, uh, thank you. No, I really enjoyed it. It's been brilliant. Uh, and Bryn, just thanks for your insight once again. And um, Absolute pleasure. Good, yeah. enjoyed it. I'll look forward to the Gola 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 next year. Gola Gola Gola! <laughs> and that's how we end. <laughs> thanks for everybody for joining as well. Thank you ever so much. Um, this will be on YouTube um, as well if you want to share it. And, um, yeah. Thanks, and um, hopefully we'll finish top four next year.